CEO of Haven Life, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Tim Moore. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for expressing some interest in Haven Life and for your time today. I hope you're having a good conference. Um, before I start talking about the company, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, which is me. Um, why am I in the psychedelic space? Um, and I'll tell you, it's uh, been quite a transition for me. I spent 35 years in the packaged goods industry. I spent 18 years working at Clorox, seven years running the North American business for Brita. And I transitioned into cannabis, I guess, five years ago uh, for personal reasons. Um, before I tell this story, everybody's OK, um, but they weren't always. I have five sons. I've dealt with mental health issues for the last 35 years. I had two sons with anxiety disorder. I had a suicidal 14-year-old. My middle son got hit by a drunk driver and was uh, seriously injured and ended up as an opioid addict. I spent two years watching him disappear into his couch. Um, and ultimately, it was cannabis that saved his life, uh, which got, gave me the motivation to transition into that industry from packaged goods. But when I saw what psychedelics can offer for anxiety, depression, PTSD, substance abuse, I knew that's where I wanted to spend this part of my career. So um, my observation on mental health, by the way, is that typically we medicate patients to make them easier to live with rather than to make their lives better. Certainly that was my experience when I look in the rearview mirror and I feel guilty for um, some of my behavior in, in treating my sons to make them easier children to live with. That's why I think that the psychedelics business is actually the industry of hope, the hope for people to live a normal life. Because for many people with anxiety, depression, PTSD, the best they can expect today is to find some combination that gets them numb enough to get through the day. And I believe that that numbness too often leads to suicide, where psychedelics actually offer them the opportunity to reset their lives, look forward to the day ahead, look forward to spending time with a loved one, look forward to going on vacation and living their lives. So I feel that I'm in the industry of hope. With that, let me talk a little bit about Haven Life. Um, we're very focused on cognitive health and human performance, and everything is evidence-based. We have uh, two distinct business models to support that. Uh, one is uh, uh, Haven Retail, which is a range of non-restricted compounds that support mental health and human performance. And our core business is Haven Labs, which is uh, naturally derived psilocybin to support the industry. With what is a diverse strategy, we've put together a diverse um, uh, organization, both our um, management as well as our board of directors and our advisory board. Uh, myself, my background in packaged goods, um, Ivan Castleman, who has, he's a third generation cannabis person and has been working in uh, psychedelics for about a decade. He has a, a PhD in plant science. Ivan, Alex, our chemist, has worked in uh, both restricted compounds of cannabis um, as well as with psychedelics. Um, Gordon, our CFO, has significant public markets experience as well as controlled substance experience. Uh, Jenna, our COO, has 18 years in uh, the nutritional supplement space. And Juliana, who runs quality and regulatory for us, has worked in pharmaceuticals, cannabis, and now in psychedelics. Our board and advisors have deep experience, not only in packaged goods and in nutritional supplements, but also in pharmaceuticals as well as uh, in uh, um, cannabis. So I feel that we've got a great team. We've got a lot of operational experience uh, that has allowed us to put together a really great business plan. Um, we have two distinct paths to, to revenue. On the retail side, uh, we have launched our products both under our own brands as well as under White Label. We're on uh, .com as well as retail. Uh, we have our own e-commerce site, um, yourhavenlife.com. We're on Amazon in both Canada and the US, and we're on other e-commerce sites. And in Canada, we've gained distribution at a number of retailers, uh, specialty retailers, as well as food, drug, and mass retailers. And we have a white label agreement um, in place and others in, under discussion. In uh, uh, May, we shipped a container of product to Australia for our partner there, Woke Pharmaceuticals, who will be distributing under their brand name in New Zealand, Australia, and in China. And we're taking that path towards our international expansion is through white label agreements. On the lab side, we're a supplier to the industry. So we're selling picks and shovels to the researchers. 
So we're actually agnostic as to which one of them gets to the finish line and gets approval from the FDA because we're the supplier of API to a number of them and I'll talk about the supply agreements that we have in place. So um, where does the opportunity come from on the lab side? It's, we're in the mental health industry. Mental health is a huge and growing problem. There are uh, billions of dollars spent on treatments. There are billions of dollars of lost productivities. And most people have someone in their lives who's been touched by mental health issues. The problem is also growing. I feel that we're going to have an echo pandemic coming out of COVID of mental health issues, whether it's people who were directly affected by the disease by being ill themselves or had their life interrupted. They lost their job. They lost a business. They lost a loved one. They couldn't visit them in the hospital. They couldn't have a funeral whatever it was for them, or just living trapped at home with kids that you're trying to help homeschool and figuring out how to run your life without leaving your house and living under constant anxiety. And if you don't think there's been mental health issues, how often have you seen somebody in their car by themselves wearing a mask? Okay? So we're going to see a pandemic that comes because of it. Then layer on that, uh, medical people and first responders that have been working under battlefield conditions for, for two years now. When was the last time we built temporary morgues? When was the last time we built temporary hospitals? Not in my memory. And so we can't expect people to have been through that without there being some mental health consequences. So I see that it's going to grow. The second mega trend is the attitude towards mental health. It wasn't that long ago that one flew over the cuckoo's nest was reality where we just called these people crazy and we put them in asylums and sanatoriums and we didn't think about them. Today, it's acceptable to say, I'm not okay. It's acceptable to say, I'm getting treatment. That's allowing more and more people to come forward and seek treatment for their mental health issues. So it's growing the, the, the availability of, for more patients. There's also a backlash against pharmaceuticals that people are seeking alternative treatment. And there's hundreds of thousands of people self-medicating today with psychedelics and other substances because they've, they've had challenges with pharmaceuticals, whether it's been weight gain or sexual dysfunction or dependency or whatever their reason is for moving away from that, or it simply hasn't worked for them. The third trend that we're seeing is a, an evolution in public policy. So you've seen the news stories around Oregon and Washington, D.C. and Ann Arbor, Michigan and Denver and other places that have decriminalized. That doesn't really create um, a commercial opportunity, but it's a harbinger of where attitudes are going. What we are seeing, in Canada in particular, we're headquartered in Vancouver, we're seeing end-of-life exemptions being granted to people, particularly cancer patients suffering from end-of-life anxiety, either under the Section 56 exemption or under the Special Access Program. And we, we're participating in the Special Access Program. We recently announced a partnership with a not-for-profit organization called Theracil who is working with us in Health Canada have our psilocybin approved for the special access program so that any physician in Canada can prescribe psilocybin to a patient who has not responded to other treatments. Um, in particular the veterans group uh, as a cohort is a, 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 a significant um, uh, area for mental health issues. One of our board members, Tim Laidler, is a veteran himself. He served in Afghanistan. By the way, he spent the last year and a bit helping to evacuate people from Afghanistan. He and his uh, uh, group of uh, volunteers have had over 2,500 people that they had in safe houses that they've got out of Afghanistan in the last uh, 12 months. But veterans, as I said, have this specific issue. In 2021, in the United States, there were over 7,000 veterans committed suicide. And somehow that's not seen as a crisis. By the way, in the same period of time, we had over 100,000 people die of opioid overdose deaths. In British Columbia in 2021, we had more opioid overdose deaths than we had COVID deaths. And we didn't mobilize against opioids the way we mobilized against COVID. So there are these acute groups. And I personally believe that, that veterans and uh, first responders will be identified as a cohort to be the first group to get legal access to clinically administered psychedelic uh, assisted therapy. I think that that's going to happen in the next three years because I believe that that group will be identified as a crisis. 
So what are we doing? Um, we're working with the researchers. People are looking at microdosing, and for those of you who aren't familiar um, with psychedelics, with psilocybin in particular, you take approximately a 25 milligram dose, you're going to have a psychedelic experience. If you don't know what that looks like, on Netflix, um, there's a program called Goop Labs by Gwyneth Paltrow, season one, episode one. She takes her team to Jamaica for a psychedelic uh, event. You can, in 43 minutes, you can learn everything you need to know about what what does a psychedelic experience look like? What companies are seeking is how can we provide a therapeutic do dose without the psychedelic event? Because the psychedelic event is, um, can be overwhelming. Um, some people are just afraid of it. Um, and frankly, it's actually a better commercial model to have people that are administering medication several times a week rather than once or twice a year. So our three customer groups, our three major customer groups, first of all, are psychedelic retreats in places like Jamaica, Antigua, Costa Rica, St. Kitts, and other places. This morning we just um, uh, issued a press release for a partnership with a company called Green Stripe, which is a cannabis, a licensed cannabis producer in Jamaica. They will be acting as our distributor in Jamaica, not only to retreats there, but also to um, the, the legal dispensaries where they're, they're selling their cannabis. All of the re their um, all of their dispensary customers have been asking them for psychedelics and versus street mushrooms which are legal in Jamaica we offer a certificate of analysis which provides predictable dosing and and you know, you know, no pesticides herbicides heavy metals etc so it provides a competitive advantage particularly for people that are paying five thousand dollars for a three-day psychedelic retreat that are interested in making sure that they're getting accurate dosing and safety so retreats are our first group the second are the psychedelic assisted therapy clinics um, an example would be Atma Journey Centers in Calgary, Alberta. They were the first uh, business to legally administer psychedelics in Canada. We have an agreement with them. We've signed agreements with other um, clinics that are currently focused on ketamine that are anticipating that psychedelics will be approved for use in the United States in the coming years. And we're also working on uh, uh, relationships in the UK. The third group are the new de drug development companies that are doing traditional new drug development clinical trials. An example there would be Revive Therapeutics that's having their uh, clinical trials administered through the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and we're working with them right now on um, finalizing the specifications for what we're going to ship to them for those trials. They're looking at administration through a sublingual um, breath strip. So uh, psychedelics, the, the research, it, there's been a lot of leg legitimate research here, and it's over five decades of it, and it's places like John Hopkins and NYU and USC and uh, King's College and Imperial College, and unfortunately, psychedelics got caught up in the war on drugs, which, in my opinion, was really a war on patients, um, and psychedelics fall under um, their there, uh, section one, which means no medical benefit, which seems oxymoronic given how much evidence there is on the amount of uh, medical benefit there are for people. Um, why are we in Jamaica? We're in Jamaica because uh, psychedelic mushrooms are psilocybin is seen as a functional food, not as a drug. So we're working with the Ministry of Agriculture there. They're very keen to build a psychedelics industry. For those of you familiar with the history of Jamaica, they kind of blew it on sugar and on aluminum. So they're looking at how can we have value add in Jamaica with psychedelics. So we're having great cooperation with them. We cultivate under good agricultural collection processes. We transfer it to a GMP pharmaceutical facility to process it. It leaves Jamaica as an agricultural product and it lands in the United States, Canada, or the UK as a controlled substance. And we've validated that supply chain and successfully shipped product to Canada and the US. We're working on the UK. If we manage to do that, we'll be the first company in 40 years to legally import psilocybin into the UK. Um, I remind people that psilocybin is not illegal, it's just highly regulated, like guns, alcohol, and tobacco. We look at those regulations as a barrier to entry. We have assembled the intellectual capital to navigate it, because frankly, to send an agricultural product out of Jamaica and have it land as a DEA-regulated controlled substance is really complicated. And we've done that, and, and we're able to replicate that. So it does give us a competitive advantage and a barrier to entry. Um, what are the advantages of natural psilocybin versus synthetic? First is price. Synthetic psilocybin is really expensive. It's, in the U.S., it's currently priced from $7,000 to $10,000 a gram, which makes it $7 million a kilo. 
I just talked to uh, my contact at Revive Therapeutics, and he just got quoted 25,000 euros a gram in Europe, 25 million euros per kilogram. Uh, we can grow mushrooms a lot cheaper than that, by the way. Mushrooms are really easy to grow. You just unplug your fridge and wait three days, and you're growing mushrooms. But what's hard to do is to grow GMP-compliant mushrooms that can be administered to humans under a clinical trial. That's what we figured out how to do. And so that sets us apart. The other benefit with, uh, with synthetic or naturally derived is it provides you with the other molecules that are present in the mushroom. So we're able to offer what in cannabis is referred to as a broad spectrum experience by offering the other alkaloids that are there. And then the third thing is patient preference. People that are seeking an alternative to pharmaceuticals don't want a molecule that was grown on a petri dish on E. coli. They want something that came from a plant. And we saw the same thing in cannabis where synthetic THC came out and the news was nobody's going to build greenhouses anymore. Well, nobody goes into a dispensary and says, give me some synthetic THC cartridges, please. They want the plant. Frankly, they're more interested in what music does the head grower listen to than they are that it's synthetically derived. So we have significant advantages by having naturally derived product, and the companies that we've talked to that have signed supply agreements believe that as well. Okay, let me move on to Haven Retail. So these are not controlled substances. These are products that fall under the same rules as glucosamine, chondroitin, um, uh, melatonin. But they're still plant-derived products and they still affect mental health. And so this is leveraging our experience in consumer packaged goods to have a business that supports mental health the same as our psilocybin, but gives us a path to market and a path to revenue on a much more accelerated basis. We have seven functional mushroom products and we have four traumatic brain injury products that are patented. These are all on the market today. You can go on Amazon.com and order them if you want. And if you want a sample, just see me and give me an address and I'll have samples sent to you. Um, our functional products, this is an image of them. They support things like focus, anxiety, um, immunity. Um, our uh, rhodiola product in particular, I have my 19-year-old uh, son was taking them because we went through a year and a half of him doing school by distance. He has social anxiety and he had to sit in front of his computer with the camera on him so that they would know he wasn't cheating or that he was actually there. Um, and it was driving him crazy. I put him on our rhodiola so that he could calm down and get through his, his school day. By the way, Schools really blew it, I think. I think that the interface that those poor kids had to go through was atrocious. I think we're gonna see really profound problems with that cohort of kids that had their high school career derailed. And it's, it's, I've seen it personally, and I just think that, that it's a terrible thing. So, set that aside. Um, our traumatic brain injury products, we acquired this last year, patented product. It's been, it was a number of years in development. The inventor who joined us as our director of education um, is a sports injury expert. He was, um, he worked for like the Toronto Maple Leafs and some other professional teams and saw injuries. Um, did a lot of work towards uh, developing these products, got it patented. And we have 19 professional sports teams that are using this product as part of their um, traumatic brain injury program. Um, our PM product in particular, uh, which comes in a flavored, unflavored version, one of the key benefits of that is helping people sleep. Those people that have traumatic brain injury, one of the key problems they have is they don't get good sleep. And that's one of the great benefits as well as providing um, recovery, memory improvement, and, and, and so on. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about the, the opportunity for this product. Again, what we're exploiting is a mega trend. Almost three quarters of the population takes um, nutritional supplements on a regular basis. I take glucosin. Hmm? Yeah. So I take uh, tart cherry for my gout and glucosamine and chondroitin for my um, uh, 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 arthritis. I take collagen for my joints. So for me to add a functional mushroom is a really small step. It's just part of my daily routine. Once a week, I lay out my pills for the week and I just take them. So this becomes a very sticky business. Once you get people taking these products, it does become a recurring revenue model. So we're really excited. It really comes down to what's the cost of acquisition for a patient, because the lifetime value of them is pretty significant. Our products retail for between $35 and $50 per month, for, for month's dose. Um, looking forward, I just want to give some time for, for questions. 
Um, on the retail side, we need to expand our retail footprint. We've deliberately not pursued retail in the United States because it's a really expensive cash burn. Now, hey, the good news is we got a purchase order from CVS. The bad news is we got a purchase order from CVS because now we got to spend $10 million to pull the revenue, the, the product through the stores. In the US, our focus is on dot com. In Canada, where the costs are lower, we've secured retail distribution and we've got uh, some uh, great uh, traction there and, and adding some additional business. We'll continue to build out our portfolio of products. We've got a number of formulas under development. And we're also going to continue our, our discussions on white label for international expansion because then we're using other people's money for the marketing, right? Um, I really like the white label model. On the lab side, we have successfully exported to Canada and the US. We're working on the UK project. Um, we're, we've had our first revenue from our supply agreements. We've shipped product, which does set us apart from most psychedelics companies that have no revenue. We actually have um, some revenue from last fiscal year. It ended April 30th, and we're in revenue as we speak now. Mind you, it's small numbers, but it's not zero. Um, and then it's just a matter of expanding our scale and capacity to support our supply agreements. Our facility in Jamaica has enough uh, capacity. If we if we just increase the the um, uh, equipment there, we've got enough capacity for um, as much demand as we'll see over the next five years. Um, looking at our cap table, we have about 150 million shares out, uh, 200 million on a fully diluted basis. We have no debt. Um, uh, we've been working feverishly to manage our cash flow. Um, as you know, with the psychedelics and microcaps in general have been under a bit of duress. This is not the time to raise capital. It's the time to tighten your belt and look forward to days when you can raise capital. So we've been very focused on that. Um, and that gets me to the thank you slide.